Wealth Management, offering guidance on retirement income, social security, and estate planning. More at fisherinvestments.com. Clearly different money management. Investing in securities involves the risk of loss. It's 49 degrees outside University Studios. This is 94.9 KUOW, Seattle's NPR news station. And it's 12.06, and that means it's time for Week in Review with Bill Radke. Welcome to Friday. Welcome to Week in Review. Bill Radke here. For the next hour, I tell you stuff that happened this week that you might have missed, or you might have heard about it and said to yourself, I'll find out all about that on Week in Review. And then you get here, and you're happy to find out that it's not just me. It's me and three excellent journalists, which this week are Seattle Times senior investigative reporter Patrick Malone. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Bill. Thanks for having me. Welcome back. As always, Crosscut staff reporter Hannah Weinberger. Hi, Hannah. Hi, everyone. It's great to speak with you. Yeah, and with you and Seattle Channel host and producer Brian Callen. And hey, Brian. Hey, Bill. Thanks for having me. Uh, so happy you're here. Of course, we uh, I, I can see my guests and so could you. Certainly nothing stopping you. You can just check out our live stream by searching KUOW Public Radio at either YouTube or Facebook. Can Facebook still afford to do live streaming after what happened to them this week? I think so. <laughs> yeah. I hope, I hope so. Lost a quarter of their stock value uh, yesterday. Tough week for the metaverse. It, it is now a miniverse. Uh, okay, let's get to uh, some of the big stories of this week. You know, Seattle and Washington State have been trying to reform the police, uh, rein in the police in some cases, without undermining, uh, undermining their mission to protect and serve. So how is that going? We're going to get to the state level in just a moment. First of all, in Seattle this week, we got an official report on a police killing, Patrick, the death of a man along the Seattle waterfront. What happened there? Well, uh, you know, Essentially, there was a circumstance where there was a man in crisis. He was in possession of a knife. His name was Derek Hayden. This was about a year ago. It was last February. And, uh, you know, there was a plan to stall among the officers from Seattle PD who were present, the goal being to kind of de-escalate the situation. But one cruiser with two officers pulled up, uh, kind of dashed the whole plan, immediately began shooting. Uh, they fatally shot him and so you know it, it's brought up something that is you know there's there's a whole body of research really emerging about police and their use of lethal force against subjects with knives and at barnhard college you know one one of columbia's autonomous undergraduate colleges they're doing really groundbreaking work that sort of pegs officer overreactions to training that instills fear and so they find that it's even worse and even more disparate for outcomes of people with color. And it seems like the Seattle Police Department has taken this phenomenon more seriously in the past year. They have specific training, even some equipment to disarm suspects with knives short of killing them. Uh, but the question is whether the culture that exists among some officers inclined to make force the first option will really trump their training. And this has been a, a grim subject for Seattle police. It, it's been a debate for over a decade. We've seen these kind of deaths. And I think, uh, you know, we saw discipline handed out here of one day suspension for one officer, three days for another one. Uh, that just kind of to the public seems like not very much for an unnecessary killing. Uh, I think the ruling that came out specifically found that these officers, uh, their misconduct was that they interrupted the plan to stall and de-escalate, but they did not violate the lethal force policy because this, this gentleman had a knife. And uh, th these are the kind of things that are going to be part of future conversations and were part of conversations last year in Olympia when, you know, there was legislation to, to curb the ability to uh, you know, use force on mental health subjects. And my colleague, Daniel Gilbert, wrote about that a very heartbreaking story recently about, you know, this man was basically living and dying uh, in front of uh, a drugstore where he was living in his car and police wouldn't intervene. And there are jurisdictions that have said, we, we won't intervene because you're setting us up to break the law. And now there's a similar proposal that would curb officers' ability to use force when someone tries to flee an interrogation. Okay. And I, I want to debate. pause, Patrick, because you, you, you've just told us a whole bunch of, uh, and, and I have questions, and I think my other panelists do, about a lot of it along the way. I started with this, this case on the Seattle waterfront, and as you mm -hmm. said, it was a, there was the, the police chief gave these officers a one-day suspension and a three-day suspension, and we were talking about this, and Hannah, you, 
you and I, and I'm sure Brian probably too, shared mm -hmm. a question about about that seeming discrepancy, Hannah, go ahead. Right, you know, I what, what doesn't gel for me as someone who does not cover, you know, police force, and I may be speaking out of turn here, but, you know, these officers created a situation that was threatening by immediately drawing their weapons, and they drew their weapons on someone who came to them for help, like bad help. He was obviously not in a good place, but they came, he came to them for help, and like knowing what you know about police use of force in Seattle, I can't imagine him feeling more safe by them immediately drawing their weapons, which Patrick alluded to as kind of the culture for some people on the force. But the fact that the reprimand was, you know, a few days of suspension when the impact of their decisions leaves so many people dealing with trauma, you know, this, this man, Mr. Hayden was a, you know, Seattle University grad student who mm -hmm. has family who now have to deal with that, who is part of a community in Seattle who now have to deal with that. Um, and this is a community trauma. So it's more about, you know, it, it's not just about decreasing harm in the immediate situation, but preventing communities from having to deal with further trauma. Absolutely. And just yeah. to dovetail on this bill, it's, uh, it's important to point out that Hayden was in the middle of a behavioral health crisis. And I exactly. think this, this this really speaks to what Patrick was talking about, what's going on at the state level right now. I think we're seeing it statewide. A number of officers out there are saying, we don't even want to get involved in these behavioral health crisis cases, where beforehand they would. They'd be involved in these cases where there might be some sort of involuntary commitment type of situation. A lot of officers are saying, wait, there's no crime being committed here. We're going to back out entirely. And that's not really what lawmakers were trying to do last year with that raft of bills they passed. More than a dozen police accountability measures were passed there. So what I think they're trying to do this year, at least what I've seen at the state legislative level, is try to uh, figure out ways to provide some clarification there. Officers are looking for clarification. The public is looking for clar clarification too. When should officers respond? Should it be in, in these cases with behavioral health crisis? I think you'll hear from a lot of people around the state that yes, that is an important part of what they do. And then this other part of Actually, uh, should they be able to chase down suspects or whatever else? There's a fine line. Right, there I, I, wait, I do oh, want to get to that. Yeah, I go do, ahead. So I want to get to that. I just still, I mean, we're. Yeah. I, I want to understand, help listeners understand mm -hmm. this case that was reported on this week by the Office of Police Accountability mm -hmm. before we get to state level stuff, which is important. Um, Patrick, did you want to respond to Hannah's question about the uh, this this idea that the officers, according to the uh, watchdog agency, they violated policy in the first place by not de-escalating the situation. Um, so, in fact, I, I, I copied a quote here. The report said, quote, this caused the breakdown of the plan employed by the other officers on scene mm -hmm. and ultimately resulted in the fatal shooting of Hayden. So resulted in the fatal shooting, and yet the police chief as I say, only gave these officers a one day suspension and a three day suspension. As you said, that that's that what they did wrong is different from violating the lethal use of force situation. I mean, he was walking toward them with a knife. But is this just a what are you going to do kind of situation? Um, did the did the police chief there seems to be a disconnect between a one to three day suspension and a quote ultimately resulted in the fatal shooting of someone? Well, I think it seems so oh, go for it. I think that people in a lot of professions are looking at that and saying, what the heck, man, far lesser mistakes that don't cost a human being their lives cause people to lose their jobs when they're not in law enforcement. But then, you know, the key issue that underlies it all is the union contract, the police union contract, and how discipline is meted out there. And ultimately, if we want to see reforms in the type of discipline that garners truth from communities, it's going to have to come with appropriate discipline. Okay. Um, so let me make sure that I, I, we've sort of covered the situation there. I guess this, this, uh, the issue of it being a knife rather than a gun, I was wondering, mm -hmm. does, the le does the Seattle Police Department lethal force policy take into account that a knife is less dangerous at a distance than a gun when they, when yeah, is that how is that accounted for? Is do you think it's it's is there discussion of refining the policy or is it the policy is what it's going to be? 
can I jump in real quick on this yeah. one? Because I, I hear what you're saying, Bill, and I think this is a conversation that's been going on for a while with the Seattle Police Department. Certainly a lot of focus on it over the last couple of years. The OPA has brought that up. But I think back to 2010, the case of John T. Williams, the First Nations word carver. He had a knife. He was approached by police. They ended up shooting him and killing him. And that really was one of those events that pushed the Seattle Police Department into the federal consent decree process that's been around for more than a decade here. So I think this is a situation where this type of discussion over what do you do when there's a knife involved or whatever else, it's been going on for some time here. But again, I think we come back to this issue that you can talk about the training that happens there when it's actually executed, when it's actually meted out by officers on the street, there can be some discrepancies there. So I think that's that's a part of this situation, too. Yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, there is to an extent a policy. Life, someone is walking toward you. And by the way, saying, uh, you know, I want you to shoot me. I want you to kill me. I want you to kill me. It's it's clearly a dangerous situation. Yes, Patrick. It just it seems like there's almost conflicting policy because we we see that in the past year there's been a very open acknowledgement from the Seattle Police Department in the equipment it's bought in the training it's done to try to mitigate you know shootings when there's a knife involved. However, at their core policy, it is not a violation to shoot someone with a knife 15 feet away, and 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 kill them. You know we see that here. These two officers who got the discipline it certainly wasn't for applying lethal force in this case and so i think there's a disparity there that uh the police department needs to perhaps scrub its own policies for things that are in conflict that could cause confusion for officers in these very hot moments right that's that's what i was getting at yes hannah oh i just say like and to go off of that from the context perspective like if you're considering ways to adjust your policy maybe consider um adjusting for the situation leading up to the instance. Like if your policy is that it's you know not a violation to do this, if someone has a knife, if they're moving towards you, et cetera, what happened in the moments leading up to that? Did you interrupt an in-process you know, police uh, response where they were attempting to defuse things? Did you go along with you know what people were deciding was the appropriate course of action in the situation? did you create this situation in some way even if the person that you're dealing with is in distress i want to emphasize but does have a knife and maybe isn't making the best decisions at this point like how did you contribute to a negative environment yeah okay uh, so we we started to talk about a police reform at a state level we've been talking about this for years and there was some big movement especially this last year but now it's, I think Brian called it reforming the reform. So let yeah. me just set this up, Brian, and you can yeah. explain. Uh, state lawmakers are revisiting a uh, this police reform law that they passed last year that critics of the law, like this is the mayor of Renton, Armando Pavoni, saying the, the law as it's actually turned out is letting people walk away when officers tell them to stop. My fear is that in some cases we've tipped the balance the wrong way and unfairly hamstrung our officers replacing certainty with confusion and helpful action with hesitation. So one house proposal would restore the ability of law enforcement to use force to briefly detain someone based on reasonable suspicion that they were involved with the crime. But supporters of the law that was passed last year say law enforcement is just trying to take back its power now. This is Katrina Johnson talking on the steps of the state capitol. Her cousin, Charlena Lyles, was shot and killed by Seattle police. The status quo is what got our loved ones put in caskets. What we need in the caskets is House Bill 1788 and House Bill 2037. That's what needs to be in the casket. This is not a time to dial back police accountability. Okay, Brian, what should we know to understand this debate? There are a few different pieces, at, uh, if you think about it on the larger level level here, Bill. We're talking about House Bill 1304 and uh, 1510 from last year that spoke to these, or excuse me, 1034 and 1510 uh, that were out there. Uh, what they're trying to do is control when officers get involved and also what type of force they can use. So those are the two main themes that you're thinking about here. And you're looking at these two different sides of it. Police are saying they're hamstrung. They can't do what they actually want to do. You'll see a lot of House Republicans, uh, Senate Republicans, too, down in Olympia saying, all right, we need this new raft of safe Washington bills to kind of roll back what happened last year in the session here. But I think you're hearing it from a lot of Democrats, too, as they move forward here. What they're hoping to do is 
refine these different laws that were passed last year. Because I think if any lessons were learned from the George protest, George Floyd protest of 2020, there are some reforms that need to happen here. So I think the whole idea is to try to find some sort of middle ground here, because you'll hear a lot of different rhetoric uh, down in Olympia and around the country, too. You're anti-cop, you're pro-cop or whatever else. What I'm hearing from a lot of Democratic lawmakers, including Representative Jesse Johnson from the 30th down in Federal Way, he was one of the authors of these different bills going forward. He's really talking about trying to find those different ways we can reach that middle ground here so you can de-escalate things. Officers can de-escalate things, but they can do it in a way that keeps the public safe and keeps officers safe, too. So this is that difficult middle ground that they're trying to reach here. But I think that's the bottom line that Olympia is trying to get through here so they don't lose the momentum of last session when it comes to police reform and get real about this in terms of helping out officers, too. Okay. Any any other comment on on the police reform and the the reform of the reform or the rollback of the reform? Uh, there are questions about when a chase is actually warranted and when it's not warranted. Does not chasing someone mean that they're going to go hurt somebody or that that um, uh, yeah? What do you what do you have to say about this Washington State debate about the debate? Uh, maybe I'll just start on that whole idea with chasing people, Bill, and, and if uh, others want to jump in, please do. I think what you're seeing is this debate over uh, is there a reasonable suspicion or is there a probable cause, right? So you're looking at what's going on here. Uh, there are a number of different cities that are actually all around our area. Sammamish comes to mind as one that actually limits any sort of chases at all when it comes to police activity. They can be dangerous. They can hurt people. They can kill people people, including bystanders. Seattle has some limitations on how chases can happen or when they should happen. So I think that there are some common sense is a word that gets thrown around a lot, but I think there are some guidelines that the state's going to be looking at that a lot of different municipalities have put together here. Again, they're kind of working on that fine line between, okay, can we trust the officers to go with their uh, go with their gut here and go after things? Or we do, do we need that higher standard of probable cause? I think this is something that's going to get hashed out. And again, I want to make sure that I stress this. This is something that police want to they want to try to make sure that there are there are some guidelines out there so they know what to do in these different cases, because we're, we're in a litigious society, as you know, and I think they want to make sure they're doing the right thing and they're doing the right thing in terms of public safety, too. I think there's also, you know, historically, when it comes to law enforcement reform, needed to be a second look, no matter how well intentioned legislation may be. And I think we don't have to look any farther than I-940 to see that. Then, mm -hmm. you know, here, here it was something that uh, the electorate voted and 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 then the legislature had its moment to perfect it two years ago remind us patrick about i-940 oh uh, yes i-940 was a police accountability law that uh strove to get more independence when police investigate other agencies for in-custody deaths so an example would be the manuel ellis case in tacoma where tacoma police uh were you know dealing with mr ellis and they killed him and the Pierce County Sheriff's Department investigated. And this was in the immediate aftermath after the legislature had supposedly honed this to be a very good practical law. But then what we see in practice is law enforcement changing the quantum physics of that law. You know, uh, the independence wasn't there. The conflicts of interest continued. And when the AG reviewed more than 30 of this, these cases that were initially done right after I-940 became law, it, the the abuses and violations were rampant. So I think it's not unusual to have to, you know, tidy up the practical effects of a law. But one of the issues that seems to be increasingly driving that is law enforcement's reluctance to, you know, just sort of to take their ball and go home if there's a law that they don't like. And that's sort of an activist stance. Um, we could see the similar results, you know, that that we did with the mental health checks with this uh, no pursuits situation where it just becomes uh, you know, an, an issue of defiance. And so the legislature has to consider what it can do to make this law effective from a practical point of view, even if law enforcement is resistant. Okay, we need to take a break here on Week in Review. We've been talking about uh, the reform of police reform and we're covering the big news of the week. We're gonna catch you up on COVID and some of the repercussions from the pandemic when it comes to schools and the powers that a governor has to declare and maintain a state of emergency. We're talking with Patrick uh, Patrick Malone here. We're talking with Hannah Weinberger and Brian Callanan. I'm Bill Radke. We'll be right back on Week in Review.
Thanks for being with us today on KUOW 94.9. It's 26 minutes past 12 o'clock. Support for KUOW comes from the Corporate Bankruptcy Restructuring and Finance Group at Ryan Swanson Law, celebrating 125 years of serving clients in the Northwest, guiding businesses through complex bankruptcies, receiverships, and other insolvency matters. Learn more at ryanswansonlaw.com. Everything you hear on KUOW is made possible by listener support. Mary from University Place said she supports KUOW and NPR because it's important to stand up for what's right and tell people in charge what's what. You depend on KUOW as well. Show your support today by becoming a monthly KUOW member to sustain this important work all year long. Join us online at KUOW.org slash donate. Let's return to Week in Review. You're with Crosscuts Hannah Weinberger, Seattle Channel's Brian Callanan, and the Seattle Times' Patrick Malone. I'm Bill Radke. When listening's not enough, you can join our live stream, watch the show at YouTube or Facebook. Uh, on with the Week in Review here, we got some more good news this week on the COVID front. King County Public Health Officer Dr. Jeff Duchin says the county is seeing a third fewer cases than about a month ago. I just want to express that my tremendous relief to see our case numbers falling since January the 10th. I really hope this decline continues. But for right now, there's still a whole lot of COVID-19 going on. Yes, more than 2,000 cases a day in King County. Hospitalizations are still high. Statewide, it's worse, about 60 deaths per day statewide. In the eastern counties of Franklin and Whitman, one out of 20 people are still getting infected compared to one in 50 in King County. In San Juan County, it's about one in 75 people. We also got good news about the new Omicron subvariant. You, you all heard about the BA2 subvariant, right? Very, we're, we're concerned. Oh, no, it's mutating again. How bad is it going to yeah. be? Uh, it is believed to spread more easily than the original Omicron, but it doesn't appear so far to cause more severe disease. And the vaccines seem just as effective against it. So here's the state epidemiologist, Scott Lindquist, uh, making me feel better. I know there's a lot of question about a sub variant of Omicron. It is the same virus. It is the same variant. It's just a twist on that. This is the same Omicron variant that we've seen the whole time. It's only a twist. And here is Linquist again, once again, dunking on the BA2 subvariant. I don't want us to chase our tails with reporting numbers of every subvariant because every variant has a subvariant. I'm not quite so interested in this one unless it has clinical implications, which it has not. By subvariant Felicia, you are dismissed. Now, there's no guarantee that the next variant will be so mild. We can only hope. Uh, Hannah Weinberger, I want to talk about how parents are reacting to the pandemic. And uh, one way is that they, some of them have pulled their kids out of public school. Yeah, you know, it's great to tell people that our case numbers are going down, even though the average is still eight times higher than it was right before, you know, the Omicron surge. But that doesn't necessarily assuage concerns of people who's kids are maybe still extremely young and uh, are still vulnerable at school. But one of my colleagues, um, Dennis Buhain, uh, did a piece recently about, you know, the enrollment numbers at public schools uh, from K through 12. So, you know, mostly the group of kids who, who are eligible or trying to get vaccinated um, and where they have all gone. Uh, since the pandemic started, because a fair number of them dropped out of public schools. Um, Do you know what any of those numbers are, Hannah, to give us some idea? Yeah, so, you know, before the pandemic, I think it was like 1.12 million students enrolled in K through 12, and uh, the most recent numbers in like October 2020 that haven't changed since now are like 1.07, I think. So it's like 4% drop in enrollment. Uh, which doesn't seem like a huge amount, but it's like, that's a lot of kids. Like, where are they right now? Mm -hmm. um, and the state is trying to figure out still, according to Venice's work, um, you know, what happened to these kids? Did they drop out to homeschool? Did they go to private schools? Did their families move states? Because you don't have to report to the state, like that your kids enrolled in a school out of state and private schools don't have to report their enrollment numbers to the state. So they get to choose some years. So it's still not clear where they went, but the fact that the numbers aren't changing means like, will kids stay out of public schools for the long term? We don't know, but that impacts the kids who do stay. 
because enrollment numbers uh, dictate, you know, where some budgeted money goes. So if your school's uh, enrollment drops off, you might not be uh, eligible for the funds that were set aside for you. Um, and so I guess there's like $900 million right now that were supposed to go to schools that haven't been doled out because the enrollment numbers dropped off. And um, Inslee's team right now is saying, well, maybe we can reinvest that money in like, you know, nurses or, um, you know, other school uh, resources that they don't have right now. But it just really drives home for me how like the decisions that parents make about what their kids should be doing affect everyone else's kids. Like if you decide to pull your kid out of school, like that school might not get as much money or they might have to, uh, you know, hustle the legislature for some other kind of help. Um, well, does the, does your, the loss of money to the school district, does it roughly equal what it would cost to educate your kid? In other words, are, Oh is, goodness. It depends how you're educating your kid. You'd have to ask Venice for more, but like yeah. private school, gosh, that's a lot more. Um, and also homeschooling has a lot of opportunity costs. You know, a lot of parents, I, I am not one right now, but shout out to all my friends who are parents and pretty much all of them within the past two weeks have had COVID cases at home. So I'm just saying like they're dealing with a lot right now who have become educators in addition to all of their other work. Like they could be doing a lot else with their time. Quality time with your kid, I'm sure is lovely. But after two years of this, I can also imagine that you might be ready to not be a parent at this point. But some people are choosing to become homeschoolers and um, you know, the like homeschool organizations in the state are trying to provide those resources. Yeah, yeah that's all, Brian, I just I, I, that's all true. I was I was thinking of this idea that you're hurting your school by not having mm -hmm. your kid enrolled because they're going to lose money. I was thinking, well, isn't that money that they would have been spending on your kid? So I was yeah, asking yeah. whether it's this is a actual problem to have fewer kids and less money to spent on educating the fewer kids. But I, I, I don't know if I made that clear or less clear. But Brian, you were trying to speak. No, no, I was I was going to say with regards to this, uh, quote unquote, extra uh, this this the dollars that are out there right now. Uh, Hannah's right. Uh, there's a lot of talk about investing in school nurses, school counselors, certainly a dearth of those around the state. But I think the other part of it that I think is really the 900 pound gorilla in the classroom, if you will, is just the way that students are achieving in schools, which is not that great. We saw a piece in the Times not too long ago that showed that student achievement numbers have fallen for every single student out there, all the different racial groups, et cetera, not good. And so looking at those numbers, you got to take a deeper dive on them, of course. But I think the indication is that those students aren't getting the support they need as they come back to the classroom. So what I think you're also going to see, not only this investment in the different health resources that kids need, but also in terms of achievement. The superintendent's office is really talking about reinvesting these dollars into the school so they can get the extra teachers they need. They can retain those teachers who are there so they can build up something to get kids back to a level where they need to be. Because I think just from my own personal experience with my own kids, I know they struggled in their different classrooms, and uh, it, it's something that every family who has kids has gone through. It's a big, big concern. I'm hoping the state can make an investment here, but this is something that's going to take a while to recover from from an educational standpoint. Okay. Exactly, Brian. Yes, Hannah. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard to know whether these kids are coming back when the COVID cases come down and the masks come off eventually and sports come back, et cetera, because we don't really know. Oh, uh, as you were saying, where they went or whether they left town or whether they're happy homeschoolers or can't wait to to come back into public school. OK, so we'll we'll watch all of that. Meanwhile, uh, Patrick, uh, I want to talk about another pandemic effect, which is a debate over our governor's powers. We are in this still in an official statewide pandemic emergency. And when we are out of that is up to Governor Inslee. That's actually how our state legislature set things up. But. A two-year emergency is annoying some lawmakers and constituents. So, Patrick, what are they trying to do about it? Well, I think, yes, I think that even people who maybe are politically aligned with the governor are at a point where, like, when is this going to end? And certainly some of it is beyond his control and some isn't. But, you know, I look at this piece of legislation, uh, this check on emergency powers as sort of what we used to call in the Colorado legislature a sweet spot bill. So it's going to appeal to anyone who politically opposes Governor Inslee because they've had to live with his decisions on masks, vaccines, shutdowns, things that have you know sparked a lot of emotion. But it's also got to look pretty good, even to many of his political allies. 
who might be pondering an eventuality that someone they're less aligned with sort of holds the governor's mansion in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. And frankly, anytime you give one branch of government a chance to limit another's, they're generally going to take it. Yeah, and, and it's interesting to watch this one play out because I think what's really at play here is just how money is spent. That's, I think, the bottom line of this whole idea of limiting the governor's emergency powers because millions and millions of federal dollars have come in. The governor's making the decision on how to do that with regard to this reform bill. What they're talking about here is after 90 days of a stated emergency, then the legislature gets a little bit more of a voice there specifically to how money is spent. And I should point out over the past couple of years, because we have been in a state of emergency over the past couple of years, 26 times the governor has had these executive orders, 26 times the legislature has supported him in those executive orders. So I think there's a, as you say, Patrick, I think there's a growing understanding that, okay, at some point here, we're going to have to transition out of emergency mode. How do we do this? You're seeing some bipartisan support for some limitations of this nature. So what what effect is the pandemic state of emergency still having? What would be different now if the state of emergency were lifted today? Or is it just more of a like, well, it's here in the background in case we need to do something emergency like? I, I think it's a, again, it goes goes back to, back to the dollar spent, wouldn't you say, Patrick? Because I think that's really the root of this in terms of how these different resources are, are put out statewide. I would say that that in practical terms is the biggest effect. And, you know, there have to be some questions asked about whether there are any unforeseen consequences about does this disrupt, for instance, a rolling federal emergency infusion of funds, right? So we need to look at the practical aspect of that and what it means for money. But I think what it means to the average citizen of Washington state is can I walk in a grocery store without a mask? Yeah. Can I still take my kids skating if if she's not vaccinated? You know, I, I think that that remains sort of the public sentiment aspect of this. But I also believe, Brian, that you're correct that in practical terms, what they're going to have to sort out is the money side of this. And, you know, who controls the purse strings? I think the legislature sees it as an opportunity to make sure that the right thing or that the thing that constituencies across the state, whatever they may be, and they we know they're varied, uh, it's people wanting to represent the people who elected them to represent them. I was going to say because thousands, literally thousands of people testified on these different bills when it comes to the limitation of emergency powers here. So I think there's some political pressure from those different constitu constituencies you're talking about there, Patrick, to act, to make something happen on this. I know Governor Inslee isn't all that happy about it, but he's feeling some pressure from Democrats and Republicans in Olympia to try to do something about this. I think that just a you know fascinating hypothetical here would be if it has the broad white bipartisan support that I expect it will because it's got this universal appeal, then it's on Governor Inslee's desk. What's he going to do? Yeah, yeah. There's something that really test. sticks out for me when it comes to like when is your emergency power supposed to be up is like the context that a lot of our legislators are thinking about what constitutes an emergency. Like I saw recently, Senator. Brad Hawkins was saying like, well, this is really for things like wildfires and landslides and earthquakes and flooding. And it's like, people think about those things as very short term emergencies. Cause the main, like one of the main focuses of this bill is like, oh, like emergency power should expire for 90 days. And it's like, we're probably gonna be facing a lot more of these types of emergencies. And they actually do have impacts that last for more than 90 days. Like some communities deal with the impacts of wildfire years down the line. Um, and I think like, you know, COVID is something where it's been happening for years and it does deserve a little bit of emergency oversight. So we can't think about emergency powers in terms of like a very short term context, or if that's a concern, you know, should there be um, different types of emergency powers depending on the longevity of the concern? I have not seen a provision in this, Hannah. That's a great point because I have not seen a provision in this that addresses an emergency that is the type of unfathomable emergency, the big rip, a nuclear war, right? Where the legislature isn't convened in 90 days. What happens then? You know, is this bill setting us up to not be able to access federal funds to get emergency help to people if there is a prolonged emergency that is a physical emergency that really impedes them even being able to logistically do the good work of government? And also we've got... It it's a political issue, but but it, it gets into Hannah's territory of science in the environment when we're talking, right? When we're talking about 
not only the science of, of uh, viruses, but climate change and just the, the, uh, the increasing number of emergencies that we might be in store for. Right, so constant state of emergency if you're a climate reporter. <laughs> and I mean, nobody expected COVID to last for two years, right? right? I mean, this was not something, this is unprecedented territory that we're in right now. So I think it's an important conversation to have at the state level. Okay, so that's our COVID update. Uh, Hannah, did I did I cut things off on the topic of school enrollment, or did you, did you feel like we covered uh, we covered that turf? I think we covered that turf. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, what I if that's the I don't know if turf gets covered, but uh, uh, I suppose in a baseball stadium it does. Uh, okay, so let's pause there then and and get you caught up on more of the of the week gone by. We're going to talk about. Uh, we, we often talk about the, the city of Seattle and other cities. Do they want to densify their neighborhoods? Do they want to upzone single family neighborhoods? Now the state might get involved and force local government's hand on this. We'll talk about that and uh, see if we have time for uh, baby bonds and barking sea lions when we come back on Week in Review. It's 1242. You're listening to KUOW 94.9 Seattle's NPR News Station. Support for KUOW comes from Puget Sound Energy, committed to helping families affected by COVID-19 get through difficult times. Details and more information about PSE's programs for assisting in-need customers at pse.com. I'm Julian Marshall, host of BBC NewsR. On today's program, the Winter Games open in Beijing, overshadowed by COVID restrictions and a diplomatic boycott. And Mount Everest hires glacier as losing decades of ice every year as a result of climate change. And BBC is coming up at one o'clock. Let's get back to Bill Radke and his guests on Week in Review. My guests are Seattle Channel's Brian Callanan, Crosscut's Hannah Weinberger, the Seattle Times' Patrick Malone, and we're bringing you the Week in Review. We're, we're talking it through. We're even uh, uh, in our little computer boxes that you can see when you uh, live stream the show at YouTube or at Facebook. You just search KOW Public Radio. So you know that it's hard to, to afford a place to live, certainly in Seattle, but in lots of Washington towns. If there were more homes that might arguably reduce the price of housing. But city governments don't always want to upzone neighborhoods designed for single family houses. Now the Washington state government might force them to do that in some cases. Lawmakers are considering bills that would open up some single family hoods to allow duplexes, triplexes, backyard cottages, so-called mother-in-law apartments. KUOW's Joshua McNichol spoke with a resident of Auburn, Tim Wallace, who's been trying to add another household to his property. What I wanted to do was uh, build a larger garage with an apartment for my disabled aunt to live in um, that would be accessible for her with her disabilities, easy mobility. Tim ran into red tape and wasn't allowed to build because of Auburn city rules that you've got to keep a 20 foot setback from the property line. So he's hoping this state law would override his local city rules. But even Tim said he can understand people's concerns about their single family neighborhood getting denser. Do I want four flexes going up everywhere? Not really, because I, I can see the argument of how the developers coming in, that could cause problems, but there's there's a flip side to everything. So Hannah Weinberger, these duplexes, triplexes, uh, backyard cottages, all of these let more households live on one piece of property. Does that mean that the housing would be more affordable? No, but also, you know, my, my colleague, Melissa Santos, looked into this and um, she does a really great job covering the legislature. I'm really grateful to her. But something that she noted in a recent piece about this was that, you know, people are acting kind of in bad faith about um, reactions to this bill. Like this, this wouldn't require cities to demolish all of your single family homes. This is a removal of a ban, like the removal of the ban doesn't mean a city can't prevent you. Um, it, it doesn't mean that a city is just going to be like all fourplexes everywhere immediately. But anyway, right. um, you know, the, Washington state's population has ballooned and we aren't building houses fast enough to house everyone who's moving here, especially not equitably or affordably. And I feel like even mentioning buying a home in Puget Sound feels kind of like you're using a bad word. Like it's so triggering for so many people I know. Mm. Um, but like, 
it is so hard to get your hands on a house here, like even as a rental. Um, and, you know, the, the idea is gaining traction, this idea of like making it not banned to have all of this housing, um, because I think like Inslee and other people are concerned about municipalities with internal friction between like to be crass, the YIMBYs and NIMBYs that make it harder to build affordable housing where it's needed. Um, but some community leadership worry that it overrides their ability to self-direct their course of growth and each city is different, but you don't necessarily get affordable housing by making a blanket, like a blanket ban on creating these fourplexes and duplexes. Obviously it hasn't been working yet. There's still not enough affordable housing. Like even when you're having all these developers building apartments with like MFTE units. So, I mean, something needs to change and people don't need to build these new fourplexes and duplexes on their property or whatever. But like, as long as cities are able to um, ensure somehow, I don't know how, some affordable housing, if you're making more of it um, and not contributing to gentrification in communities where people are being forced out of their homes anyways, um, then maybe it could work. That's a really long-winded answer to like, people are really struggling to create affordable homes here. <laughs> yeah, and, and you raised some really good points there, Hannah, because it's interesting to see the pushback on this. It's coming from smaller cities, the Association of Washington Cities pushing back on this one saying, hey, these smaller cities, because Inslee's talking about uh, places with 10,000 people or more, exactly. right? That's a pretty small city, right? So he's talking about those places allowing more duplexes in and things of this nature. But you got that pushback from the smaller cities, but then you also have the pushback from some of these housing advocates, right, who are saying, okay, we need to make sure we're putting the pause button here because just because you put in more duplexes, fourplexes, whatever else, that doesn't necessarily mean they're affordable. That can lead to the gentrification. That can lead to the displacement that we've really seen in Seattle. And this feels so much like the discussion about what we're about affordable housing that we've been having in Seattle for the past decade plus. Now put it up on the state level because you got to get real about it. Hannah, you mentioned the growth that's happening here. The stats that I saw that I saw were we've got a million people who moved to this state in the past decade in terms of the housing units that were built, 350,000. Exactly. There's a huge discrepancy there. So this is kind of the bigger discussion here. OK, you care about affordable housing. Got it. You care about you know people sliding off the scale completely and becoming homeless. OK, got it. We need to build more places for people to live. Where are they going to be? And, and that's the big discussion that's happening right now. Another when, thing. <laughs> when you see such disparate uh, promises from a piece of legislation mm. that oh, more housing, more housing might ease the price pinch, make it more affordable. And then the con argument is it furthers gentrification, you know, so uh, we've heard this story before and it was federal enterprise zones just a couple of years ago. And what we saw when they took effect is that they did drive up the price of housing. The housing was not affordable to people who worked in service jobs in the areas where these were being these construction matters were being approved. And if we think back even to the pandemic, the first early days of the pandemic, a lot of concessions to the building industry. This is, uh, you know, this is a lobby with an awful lot of clout in this state. And there's debate about whether this hurts affordable housing, whether it advances gentrification. The one thing you can be sure of is that the builders are the winners. Mm. Well, and and I, I think, think Hannah, you yeah. were trying to speak to. Yeah, no, I really agree with what Patrick and Brian are saying. I think, you know, saying that it could be a slippery slope isn't a reason to like remove a ban on some housing that a lot of people want and that could be you know important for their communities like there are places that haven't been gentrified that could still benefit from more housing like why shouldn't people have access to like more than 500 square feet in a community they grew up in you know a lot of us make that work but anyway so one, one thing that i think about when i think about this bill is that it really emphasizes building within proximity to traffic stops like one of the reasons people are concerned about affordable housing is like if we want to have a more climate friendly you know state especially puget sound where most people are you want to get people in positions where they don't have to rely on driving so much um but i really really hope that traffic stops doesn't necessarily mean like traffic stops on highways like is it a loophole because so much affordable housing and new housing like if you look at like you know where cheaper new cheaper seattle style new townhomes are popping up or like some of the mfte units and apartments are popping up it's usually apartment buildings that are like right next to the highway and that's pollution so i wonder like oh um if 
people are able to build more here? Where are they going to build and for what purpose? Like, are you going to be building next to a bus stop or a heavily used light rail station and trying to like create community that way? Or will developers just use this as an opportunity to like build up more homes near highways? And I don't know. Yeah. And certainly <laughs> that then creates a conflict for the affordability side, because yeah. having lived in Washington, D.C., I can tell you that the closer you are to a metro stop, the closer you are to a bus stop is going to really dictate the market. And so exactly. are they considering all the forces that go into this? Will will the people that you want to be able to have access to this housing realistically be able to get into it? I right. want to clear something up on that. Um, uh, Brian, you, it was something you said, but you've all sort of referenced it. So maybe you can help me. I realize opponents say uh, often say that, well, developers just want to build expensive housing. So this just is going to make they're going to demolish the affordable stuff and build the shiny stuff. But are we still? But is that the, is that the case in this discussion? No, We're no. Talking about duplexes and backyard cottages and mother-in-law apartments allowing more households on one property. Are we still? No, talking no. About shiny but that's like housing? one of the, the the arguments that people who are you know pro affordable housing, which all of us hopefully should be, are making, where it's like, oh, if there's no ban on these things, maybe it'll you know encourage developers to try to build places and where you know it's already hard to keep your home and then right. further gentrify those areas but also cities don't lose their ability to like you know have environmental review or like mm -hmm. other housing processes just have like not having a ban doesn't mean things spring up right and, and just I because these aren't mansions doesn't mean that they aren't a windfall for developers i think the scale of business that this would open up to the building industry and to developers to real estate would be significant. Right. And it's just trying to make sure that some of those units are affordable, Bill. The city of Seattle has been wrestling with this for a while with its mandatory housing affordability piece. So they're really trying to figure out ways that you can actually have affordable units in the city. The way it's played out in the city of Seattle, they've been building these new units or whatever else. And most often uh, developers are actually paying a fee rather than actually building that rent controlled type of unit in there. So I think you're right, Hannah, this is gonna be that interplay between the state and cities to try to find a way not only to build more units, but to try to ensure that some of those units are indeed affordable. So the people who need the housing the most, you hear a lot about this missing middle, that kind of area of housing that we don't have a lot of, they're trying to make sure that those people actually are served and people on the lower end of that are served too. Okay. Absolutely, Brian. Uh, sorry, I, I got to pause it there because we're we're coming up toward the end of the show. We got the the state uh, legislature considering um, opening up uh, single family neighborhoods in uh, cities bigger than ten thousand people to allow this uh, so called missing middle duplexes, backyard cottages, etc. Some local governments, including Seattle's mayor, uh, they're not so sure about this. Uh, uh, worrying about, as we said, gentrification, displacement. What about local control? So lots, lots, lots more to say about that. I want to um, I want to end with reasons to smile. Just can you, get, Brian, can you give me a quick a thumbnail on baby bonds before we do that? What is a baby bond and do you think that's going to happen? It's interesting. The state legislature is talking about this. It's the Washington Future Fund. I just talked with the state treasurer, Mike Pellicciotti, who's working on this with Yasmin Trudeau, the Democrat from the 27th district in Tacoma, new senator there. So basically, they're talking about taking some money uh, from the budget put a $3,200 aside for people, uh, babies who were born under uh, Apple Health. That's the Medicaid system in our state here. They put that $3,200 aside. They let it sit for 18 years. Then after that period, we will have those people who are 18 to age 30 able to access that money, which has been invested in the stock market there. They could probably have in between ten dollars and $15,000 Really interesting to see there, this money would have to be invested. Those kids would actually have to take a financial literacy course, but the money would be invested, they would have to be invested in secondary education or home ownership or entrepreneurship. So it's something that's happening here. They're trying to break this cycle of poverty. Some of the stats I've looked at show 42% of kids who were born into poverty stay in poverty. So this is an attempt to try to make something different there, make that windfall of capital at that later point in their lives such that they can sustain it on their own and hopefully not rely on expensive state services down the road. Is this going to pass? Are Republicans into this? Yeah, we've got bipartisan support, not all bipartisan support, but it is trundling its way through the Senate right now. It's something to watch out as we look at these different cutoffs happening over the next couple of weeks in Olympia, but it does have some support. I'm interested to see how this one goes. Okay. And one more thing, because the state could already give vouchers for adults who want homes or tuition. Yeah. Why a trust fund? It's just a way to try to, I think, 
move the needle here a little bit more, Bill? So the dollars you're talking about, yes, they definitely exist. But if the state can actually use the stock market to its advantage, put this money aside, let it grow over a period of 18, 20 years or whatever else, it can be that difference maker for someone who's like, ah, can't, do I have enough money to put down that down payment? They potentially could with this. So this is something that's just a larger amount of capital. This is something that gets in the way of a lot of people running into debt, et cetera. So the state uh, treasurer is definitely talking about this. This is something that could be that difference maker to bust people out of that cycle of poverty. Generational poverty is a real thing. And this yeah. is one of those efforts that, that could change that. Okay. Investing in the stock market. We have Mark Zuckerberg on the line. Mr. Zuckerberg, <laughs> does the stock market always go up? Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's got his head down on the desk. We're going to get back with Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, we are at the end, uh, just about the end of another week in review. And I, I want to give, I always give a chance for, for some reason to smile, Hannah Weinberger. And this, uh, this racket is making you smile, Hannah? I want this as my noise machine every time I go to sleep. I, I love sea lions. Um, and they've been making me smile for months because, uh, you know, one day I was out on a walk with my partner and we heard some working and I was like, oh my God, that's a sea lion. What? And he's like, no, those are humans being weird. And we like ran down to Ray's boathouse and lo and behold, there were a bunch of sea lions there. And I didn't know they hung out there and did some research and found a piece from Michael Crow over at King Five from back in March. He was like, oh my gosh, like there's a bunch of sea lions at Ray's Boathouse, what's happening? And he talked to some people at DFW at the time who were like, this is very rare. They probably won't hang around that long. Like they're probably here trying to escape transient orcas or cause their regular buoys are kind of bad, but they are back and they've been hanging out there pretty regularly. And it is hilarious to watch them. Like they are so bad at doing like teamwork exercises. So imagine 40 to 50 hundreds of pound animals trying to sleep on this breakwater, you know, in a cove. And every time the breakwater moves, cause it's kind of like a teeter totter. Cause one of them jumps on, like all of them decide they're in charge and they're just like, stop moving, stop moving, stop moving. And they fall off. And there's like always one sea lion, just like being an unproblematic queen at the end of the breakwater, just like, uh -huh. I, I'm not going to deal with this, but they just don't know how to work as a group. And mm -hmm. they're constantly making problems for themselves. And it just kind of, I don't know, maybe it's dark humor, but it reminds me of how we've been dealing with COVID in a lot of ways. Like people um, just don't know how to work together and we're keep putting ourselves in a situation where like, we're not going to get a good nap on this breakwater if people keep rocking the boat. We have we have got to go with your permission, uh, uh, Brian and Patrick. I'm gonna I'm gonna have that be the last word, except for the except for the barking. Uh, that's Hannah Weinberger, Crosscut staff reporter, Patrick Malone, senior investigative reporter at the Seattle Times, Brian Callanan, host and producer at Seattle Channel. Great to have you as being our our week in review. Thank you so much for for doing it, team. Thanks, everybody. Great to see ya. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Soon. The show is produced by Kevin Kniestead, social media and live streaming by Juan Pablo Chiquiza and Tio Popescu. Thanks for listening. I'm Bill Radke. Talk to you next week.